Uh, the task force is here to present to you, to you. Typically, we have teams that we have that facilitate, and they are of tribal members who come and do the facilitation and the presentation and the recording and the documents. So I want all of you to smile because you're also going to be um, live stream on KOLC. You're also be recorded. Everything that we do, we document in this process so that the people know what's going on and they can see the videos on YouTube. So when we went out to the districts, those recordings, people can go and see what some of the concerns were. What were some of the discussions regarding the Constitution? So all of this is a part of that documentation and what we're doing. And why is it started by council? Why is council doing this? Well, according to our constitution, that's where it begins. So Jackie and I were initially appointed by a standing committee to move forward on constitutional reform, but we realized we couldn't do it alone. So we formed a task force, and our task force includes some of us who are here today, and I'm just gonna quickly let them introduce themselves, and then we're gonna go into constitutional reform Halfway through the presentation, we're going to have lunch, and then we'll move on into the good stuff. And that is when we get into the articles of the Constitution, and we gather your input. So with you, you should have a packet of the agenda, the survey, the Constitution, and we also have treaties available for you as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jackie and let her introduce herself, and then we'll go from there. Good morning, um, Jackie Sears, Tribal Council Representative for Wakbamani District. And it's an honor today, you know, it's a uh, change has been in the air for wanting, wanting to be happening. And now it's in the air and it's, it's the people's chance to uh, be involved in this change. Because the change that we're going to be implementing in our new constitution is coming from the people. And we're not the ones that are going to be making the change, it's coming from you. So those surveys that we did, are we going to be getting to, and they're on, there's some more on their way, but um, that's where you do your change. You write down everything on your sur surveys, and those, those are really valuable uh, piece of paper that you're going to be um, um, filling out today. So we would like to uh, have you, you know, when you're finished with them, after the end of the day, you know, we want to compile them in that box. Your names won't be on air, and you say what you want to say here. Um, be honest, be, uh, be, you know, have your opinions ready, your, your questions and your concerns, but be honest, and nobody's going to go and take your job away, and we're not going to write down everything. <laughs> so just be... Um, comfortable with us, you know. We're all family, we're all relatives, and you got to look at us that way. Don't look at us, uh, us as council today. We're here as a task force, as a community member also who is striving for change. And um, there's two more um, task force members, uh, Robin Tapio and Lisa Jumpanigo de Leon, who couldn't be here today, but um, we will be handling that today for them too. Thank you. Good morning for those that are, are here. Uh, my name is Stephanie Star Leisure and I'm from Oglala District. Um, I'm really glad to see that they've included the employees um, because you are people, you're human, just like we are. Um, with this initiative that these two have started, it's a good initiative, but we need your input. You are part of the community, and only you can voice your concern and make a difference. So it doesn't matter whether or not we're a council. We, you, this is your tribe. And come forward and, and help us make it better for your future, your children's future. So with that, thank you. Thank you. And we also have two of our team members who are here. We have Mrs. Connie Tenfingers, who is one of our admin recorders for Team 3. We have five teams. So 
the reason we have five teams is because we go out, we run three district meetings simultaneously. So like we'll have one in Porcupine, one in Wounded Knee, one in Kyle. So they're running simultaneously on the same day. And we've typically been going out on Saturdays to all of the districts. We've also invited, we scheduled meetings for those who have knowledge of the treaties. We invited them to the meeting. And we also went out and visited our youth. So we had um, youth forums at our high schools to talk about constitutional reform and what does that mean to them. And these young people have so many great ideas and they were really polite in their request of what they would like to see for the future. So we compiled all of that information as well. So totally we went out to the nine districts and sometimes we went out twice and it was based upon volunteer basis because you know the request was there can you come out again and they volunteered the space and the food and and so we volunteered our time to be there and do presentations so with that we did that with the larger communities and um, it, it was really good because what we saw in this process is that there was representation from the Teoshpayes our numbers may not have been large like we're seeing today however it was really good quality input that was coming from the leaders of their Teoshpaye units. So with that being said, I forgot to introduce myself, so please forgive me. My name is Valentina Merdanian, and I am Oglala District Representative, but I'm also a Native Nations Rebuilder. And what does that mean? Well. The Bush Foundation really wanted to help the region, 21 tribal nations, with governance and what does that mean for self-determination. So they developed this program and they invited our people from 21 tribal nations to apply. And I was one of the first cohorts to be, I was the guinea pig <laughs> from our Oglala Nation as one of the first cohorts to go through the Native Nation Rebuilders. Today we have 20 native nation rebuilders that are within the Pine Ridge reservations that are our tribal members and they are also part of our teams. So they go out and they volunteer, they participate, they facilitate, they take notes, they do whatever is necessary. So in regards to that, I ask that you view me as a facilitator, you see me as a native nation rebuilder and as a community member because being a lifelong resident of this reservation and wanting change. And that's what we ran on, is how are we gonna make the change that makes a difference and that is sustainable and it's for our people and it's your voice that we are putting out there and we're trying to make it one nation with this revision. So with that being said, I wanna take time since we're a small group, is just to go around and quickly, five minutes, just introduce yourself quickly and, you know, maybe with what program or what community you're from, okay? And we'll start here. Back it up and turn around. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, Gilbert Mesteth, and I'm from uh, Wakwamni District. I live out here in Slim Buttes, over by the T. Where 30, 41 meets 32, I live out there. I work at the tribal office and the financial accounting office. I'm an accountant. My, I have a wife and four kids. Three of them are adults and one is still in high school. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Kenneth Hill. I'm from the Wolf Creek community of Wakbamani District currently employed with the Oglala Sioux Tribe as accounts payable. I'm interested in this meeting and its work that's being done. I'm thankful that I'm allowed to be here today. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Alice Perkins. I'm the director for the employee assistance and a member of the Wakbamani district. Um, that's it. Good morning, I'm Caroline Ballion. I'm a um, grandmother, great-grandmother, and an avid 
supporter of children. I'm acting director for Child Protection Services and uh, associate director out of the uh, executive director's office. Good morning, my name is Pamela Gallego. Um, I work for the Ogallala Sioux Tribe Higher Education Grant Program and I am also a grandmother. Mother, um, I'm r really glad that we were given the opportunity to be here and to uh, be able to go th through the constitutional reform information. It's something that has is needed and for years to uh, past how much our constitution uh, needed improvement and needed to be addressing uh, what goes on with our tribe so I'm hoping you know to get some good information and I know that um, in the end our our input you know, will have the impact, and uh, I'm grateful for that, and I thank you ladies for taking this on. Um, with the things that are going on now on our homeland here, something has to happen. There has to be some change, and it, starting with the internal structure, it is a good, it's a good start there. Pilamayaya. Uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, I'm really glad that I'm here because this is historical. You know, this has been needed for since it was first drafted, I guess, in 34. But there, there can be a lot of changes. When you look at it, um, I was kind of looking at that preamble when it says his divine providence. Now, where did that come from? Did that come from old England when they wore the white wigs and the skirts? And um, is that what they brought to the Ogallalas at the time? I think so. So I'm really excited about this. And I uh, had some good teachers. One of my teachers was uh, Oliver Redcloud, uh, the treaty people. Also my dad, who's 92 years old. So was born before this 34 Act, and he's real familiar with everything and talks to me constantly. But I always look that you have to have people's involvement to create change. And so I commend all of you for doing this. So it's about time. Thank you. Hi, my name is Anna Janice. I work at the OST Legal Department. I live in Ogallala, but I'm from the Pine Ridge District. Hi, I'm Crystal Badund, and I'm from the Wakbomini community, and I am the receptionist at the land office. <laughs> Hi, I'm Doreen Whitebull. I'm from Pine Ridge and I work at the tribal land office. Good morning, my name is Carl Eagleauk and I, uh, I'm from uh, Kyle, the Medicine Road District, um, the Little Wound community. I work at, currently work at the uh, OST tribal land office as a GIS tech. Uh, been there for five years. I'm glad to be here, thank you. Good morning, my name is Karen Redstar, and I am the director for the Ogallala Sioux Tribe Health Education Program and Fitness Center. I live in Medicine Root, or Pejuta Haka, at Three Mile Creek. I was born and raised there. And as Berta mentioned, this is really a historical a history, a movement. And guess what, it took we as to do this on our tribal council. So I really appreciate what you've done, what you're doing, and where we are going. Lila, Wapila, Chichapi. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Susan Tuigo. I am the director of the Energy Assistance Program in Pine Ridge. 
And I'm here today to share or to learn of this, of the reform that's been going on. I've been listening to you guys on the radio. It's really interesting, educational, and at times it's kind of funny because you guys like to laugh and everything. <laughs> so I've been, um, I think it's an honor to be a part of this, and I'm looking forward to the changes. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'd like to thank the task force for allowing the employees to voice their concerns and put, have their input. Um, my name is Jake Little. I'm the tribe's executive director. I'm from Payabia community, Oglala district. And uh, I think it's going to be good. Um, the employees often don't get to a chance to speak out on political change. Uh, they're so busy working and they're caught up in carrying out duties, you know, day-to-day -day duties. I think this is vital and often they know the most of what needs to be changed and, and uh, it's a good opportunity for that to happen. Thank you. Good morning, my name's uh, Milton Bianis. I'm currently the Acting Director for Victim Services and I'm honored to be here to be part of uh, this constitutional revision and I guess the main thing is to have an input on this. Thank you. Oh. Good morning, my relatives. Um, it's an honor for these um, young ladies, these warriors, to uh, um, like it's historical and it's um, team building, and that's what we need. We need something for our Takojas, and they're laying the groundwork. And in every meeting and in every kind of function that the uh, our uh, grandfathers had, our society. We started with a prayer, so I like to say a prayer for everyone. And then we're meeting with, well, like I always say, one mind, one blood, one heart. So, tukea o sheke wa kangte. Ho, tunkashla, akele a pete ke ake, wopla, a pete wa ste un hoapte, le omlicheke, omliche aki la wa kangte, la wa stekte, ake, chate wa jino, nafsula wa ji. Umlicha umhapte. Na takoshoski o teheke. Na tak waste hukte le umlicha kile. In the future, we're building a, something historical for our takoshos, our unborn. In, um, in our way of life, the circle of life, we always start with a prayer. And our spirituality kept us together. And um, we went. My ancestors went to meetings. They wiped down, purified themselves. It took days, months to come to a decision, but that was how we uh, functioned. And uh, we didn't have boundaries. I like to say a prayer for Takoja, Ori Brown, Makam, I Yinkte, Leon Petikile, Insha. Good morning, my name is Tonya Ekafi. I work for the Department of Transportation. I'm the GIS analyst and I'm from Mundetni District. Good morning, I'm Denise Evans. I work for OST DOT and I'm from Wakbamni District. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Guy Philippel. I'm Director of Social Nutrition, and I'm following the uh, revision pretty close. I, I'd like to see changes. Thank you, Pete, for the prayer. You know, we kind of got started, and sometimes we get nervous and being, being up here, no matter how many times we speak in front of the public, we get nervous, too, around our people. <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, Gina Starkumza. I come from uh, Oglala District, and welcome.
So at this time, we also want to, um, I want to say Wopila for the prayer and starting us out in a good way. And with that, I would like to have our, our people from OLC introduce themselves because they've been joining us in every meeting. They help us set up, they've improvised, they provided equipment sometimes when we didn't have it, and clear down to duct tape. <laughs> So with that, I want to I wanna acknowledge them because they've been a, a good part of what we've been doing as constitutional reform. Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Shields King and I come from Kyle, South Dakota. Um, I work for Tony Brave at KOLC TV, Oglala Lakota College Television. And we're here to live stream and get everybody's you know opinions of what they're going to do and talk about today. And, it's nice seeing a lot of you here. You know, the last few meetings we didn't see that much people, but it's good to see a lot of people here, a lot of natives. So, thank you for coming and thank you for welcoming us here. Oh, Matake LP. My name is Tony Brave. I'm the manager of KOLC TV at Okalala Lakota College. And, um, you know, we do a lot of programs, uh, we do a lot of taping, sports, events everything and I'm real interested in this project that's going on right now uh, so you know that's why we're helping because I think it's needed thank you good morning everybody my name is Michael Aisbad I'm from the Park Pine District and uh, sitting in on all these meetings has been really interesting because you can't help but overhear everything that's going on so everything that's up there I think I have a really good grasp on because I've been here, been here uh, at almost every meeting. So he can do the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, um, I'm going to have Connie introduce herself. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Whoa. Good morning, everyone. I'm really happy to see a lot of faces this morning. Uh, my name is Connie Tenfingers. Um, my maiden name is Pumpkin Seed, and it's good to see you all this morning. All right. So, you know, just like when you at if you attend church, the people in the back of the pew always get the questions. So, the people who sit in the back tables are going to get a majority of the questions. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> but we like to keep this as, as engagement. This is about you. It's not about us. So this presentation is only to help facilitate our conversation. And what we'd like to do is kind of get the mud out of the way, and that is we need to really get out there. What do we like about our current Constitution? And then what do we dislike about our Constitution? And we'll just take note. So with that, let's start out with uh, what do we dislike about the current Constitution? And so if you just want to raise your hand and and we're just going to take notes quickly. We can um, move forward with this. And I think it's just good to get it out there because this will come up in later in our discussions as we move forward. Thank you. Um, what uh, comes to mind when we talk about the Constitution um, the document, you know, a lot of us have read it throughout our lives and looked at it. Um, uh, we see the signatures on the back and we see uh, where it uh, originates from and um, the, the late 20s and early 30s, the meetings they had. Um, a lot of input then. Um, if you know other tribes' constitutions, if you look at them, you could tell there's a boilerplate taken around to different um, uh, indigenous peoples. What um, stands out as a dislike immediately, uh, going way back, I'm sure a lot of people see this, is that we're asking permission from an outside source on what is acceptable on our basic uh, foundations to live by an or organic document, they call it. You put your values, you know, what's in your heart, what, what, what's your beliefs, you put them in these documents and we all agree to live by them. And we establish laws and policies on top of those or within them and we, we find some cooperative means to, to function and um, live a good healthy life. 
But when we have to ask someone else if those things we put on a paper were, are good, are okay, are acceptable, it almost cancels out the entire meaning uh, of reasons behind having an organic document. It no longer becomes organic, it becomes um, imposed. And when it becomes imposed, then we have a lack of um, commitment by, by individuals, uh, people. They don't want to live by it because it's someone telling them how to live, not them saying, I'm going to live like this with my, with the, my relatives. So immediately what stands out as a dislike is the existing constitution is we're cons consistently asking permission on how to live. We're disempowering ourselves from the very start. Um, if we want this document to be important, vital, um, make changes for the betterment, you know, for all of us in our relationships with our neighbors, even to that extent, it's important that it is organic. It comes from us. So that's, that's what I see. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? I'm glad we have all day to discuss. <laughs> and I, in looking at the, uh, our current constitution now, you know, in, throughout my, uh, my life, I guess, my career, I've had and held positions that um, I had to go back and look at that constitution. Um, I've had a long career in the federal government, um, and therefore I felt that it was incumbent upon me to know what our Constitution was and was for, forever in a position where I would need to interpret and try to apply that to the things that were going on. Uh, I worked for the federal government but my positions were to interact with the tribal operations. I held other positions as well, and I tried to be involved in my district. I, I live in the Pine Ridge Village district. But when you look at our Constitution, sometimes it's like, well, what do they mean by that? Or the vagueness of it. And as Mr. Little was saying, you know, it's a boilerplate. It's a boilerplate, and from when we express our concerns over our IRA government, our Constitution is a boilerplate to that. And it doesn't take into a, a consideration our Lakota values in how we know that our ancestors lived and how we should be living and how we need to conduct our lives on a daily basis and uh, if, if we should come together in our teoshpais and, and discuss what's going on. Uh, we sh I believe that we should come from within be and our constitution right now is from somewhere, somewhere else, probably for the, f probably from the people who discovered us, right? Even though we all know that to be different, we were never discovered. So I think it is really important that when our constitution finally, as we're, uh, as we're calling it now, we're still going back to IRA or somebody that imposed the word constitution uh, on us and having articles and so forth. You know, in as much as we're able to go to the, uh, the way that our ancestors lived and in governing or taking care of ourselves so that we bring back the moralities, the spirituality. That's a very core and basis of anyone's existence. 
and especially us as a Lakota people. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, my main, my main concern was uh, the boundaries, like the districts. In, in past experience, once we put up boundaries, like uh, Penny was saying, like uh, you have a conflict, a conflict comes in play. And what I like to do is, uh, to be realistic, is decrease the number of the representatives and if possible, have it at large, like a nine-month, nine-member representative. I don't know if they could at large, but then and have our uh, districts boundaries just for like uh, allocations and appropriations and something like that. So my main concern is probably decreasing the reps to nine. Thank you. And along the sa that same line that the qualifications of the tribal council members be upgraded so that they could have a degree or a college, whatever it takes, because I believe it is really necessary. And when council meetings are, are being aired, uh, uh, over Keeley Radio and all that, we see and hear a lot of things. So I think that the, the qualifications need to be upgraded so that they can have degrees or they should have degree. A degree. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. So now we kind of, okay. I have uh, issues with the uh, boundaries too. Um, I used to live, I used to live along the creek, along the Wolf Creek, and right along in Pine Ridge. That was back when uh, Pine Ridge was actually in Wakpamni District, and uh, so we used to be part of Wakpamni District. Then we moved to Cheyenne Creek, which is north of. Pine Ridge, still in Wakpamni District, just in a different community. We we're part of the uh, Calico community. And then I grew up and I live now, oh, I lived over uh, uh, Gordon Junction, which is also in Wakpamni District. But Gordon Junction, according to the original boundaries, was either in Porcupine or Kyle, so we're right on the border there somewhere. And then we moved to, uh, to uh, Slim Buttes. I lived there now for uh, 21 years. When we moved over there, they built us a new building, a community building. And that was for our community. But we had no uh, officers, so I ran for office. There was a few of us that ran for office, and originally we were not from Slim Buttes community. But we tried to make that community building better and accessible to everybody. We got the heat going, we got water in there, and we replaced all the stuff in the toilets because they're all broke. We put a new stove in there, we put new carpet in there, and we put things on the window so they can't break in. And we started doing good. We even put a phone in there. Then the original community members came to a meeting and they said, you're not from here. We don't want you in here. We want you to go back to your district. 
Well, little did they know, I was from Wakpamni district already. So, but I hear that quite a bit in a lot of the districts. When people, the only place they could get a place to live is on a piece of tribal land that's available for a trailer house or a house, and they're not from that district. But the people from that district say, you should go back to your district. You're not from here. So we have a hard time in our own Lakota way of life of discriminating against each other. I know that's not part of this, but the boundaries, a person who lives in a boundary or if they uh, transfer from one district to another and because they have to live there, shouldn't be discriminated against. They're from that district, whether the original people living in a district think so or not. Pine Ridge District was about four blocks. And now it's a whole big town, eh? 3,000 people or so. All those people came from other districts. But you never hear people from Pine Ridge say, go home, go back to your own district. And guess what? Those people in Pine Ridge District, they have more than what they had before because they vote. They're voters in that district. So they have three councilmen. Before, they used to have five because they had a lot of people voting in that district. And it's just a little bitty small, maybe four sections big. And Wakpamni district has got hundreds of sections of land, but we don't have enough people to have as many representatives as Pine Ridge. People don't realize that. But if you welcome people to come and live in your district, you're going to have more people and more representatives. So I didn't, so I think the boundaries should be set and not changed. Because Pine Ridge was set and then eventually it was changed, got bigger and bigger and bigger. People who used to vote in Wakpamni district now have to vote in Pine Ridge. And I don't think things should be that way. My other one is that, um, um, gee, I forgot. <laughs> one of the things is that um, is, is hard, very difficult, is to integrate traditional law into this IRA law. It's very hard, namely because IRA is based on a, a different culture than the Lakota culture. Many of our students now in school, they have a lot of things to say about constitutional reform because they learned that in school. But the thing is, Lakota governance is way, way different than IRA governance. And that's not taught in school. It's not taught in school at all. Somewhere in our Constitution, an article or a sub-article or whatever, should reflect that our schools should teach our way of life, our culture, our language, should be the number one thing that they teach. From kindergarten clear to high school. So that when we come up to things like this to change, or fix, we know that somewhere back there, we live by respect, truthfulness, and all those things that make us Lakota. And those should be in our Constitution. And that's what I think. Thank you. I was reading this declaration from the United Nations for indigenous people. One of the things that I was involved when the Gray Eagles first formed, I was kind of a, a what you call a bee. We, me and my nieces, and we did all the cooking for them. You know, they were our elders, so there was a lot of respect. 
that we showed, but if you look at the history of the reservation and where these districts and how they were actually established, we had a boss farmer, I learned this from the Gray Eagles, and we had farm districts. And we were still one people, you know? And after he was talking and he's saying how, go back to your district, you're not from here. You know, we really lost something along the generations where we're one people, and we gotta keep that in mind. We're one, and so when you have political factions within these districts, and there's families that are running the district cap offices, then there's not uh, equal distribution of what our people should be getting. It's certain families, and we all know that. You know, we've seen that from the past. And these changes have been coming for a long time. I remember, like I said, the Gray Eagles, I said in a lot of treaty meetings, and they talked about this. How do we go back to that frame of mind where there's unity when it's, there's no unity even at the tribal council level, you know? And then it trickles down, and it's in all of our districts. So that's one of the issues, and I thought, Maybe this is not going to change for generations to come. Like Gilbert said, should be taught in the schools, and is it the younger generations that are going to make that, that positive change? And what Jake said, even if we were to do overall of this whole overhaul it, the BIA and the government are going to have the last say so. So how do you get around that? You know? That's another question. So you're going to put all this effort and energy, and then you're going to be stonewalled, you know, when it comes to passing it. So that was some of my ideas. I've been thinking about it. and But it has to start someplace and might take a while. So thank you. I think, um, did you want to continue? Because we're... We're, we're going we're gonna to get into this more in depth, and we're going to answer those questions, and we're going to address those, and we talk about, you know, the dogma of what's going on. A lot of our people are splintered, and they're undivided, and how do we come to that one nation? We're going to get into that, and understanding the history that led us to the point where we are with what happened in the 2008 revisions going up to, you know, what do we envision for the future of our Takoja's grandchildren? You know, that's what we need to, how far we need to be looking ahead when we're looking at these revisions. So with that, we're going to go into the timeline. And it's important to understand this because these are the basis of these changes that happened to our people and why they came about. What created that division amongst us as being splintered in our communities? So. In regards to that, there's somebody mentioned saying that we were discovered, and it goes back to how we were set up with the Ocheti Shakoi, and what was our relationships with other tribal nations within our area. And moving down, once the immigrants came to this country, they set up their form of government, and the oldest branch of that government is known as Indian Affairs, what we know as BIA today. That's one of the oldest forms of government because they knew that they had to deal with us given our treaties that we made early on. And there was many treaties that we made with the king and the queen. So with that being said, once the U.S. established their government and how were they going to deal with native nations and how was that going to be done in the legal sense? And this is where Marshall's trilogy comes into effect. He's three, these three willings was the foundation for Indian federal law, okay? So this is where it comes from. This is how it was established. And this is what has guided the Bureau of Indian Affairs in this process. So, okay. We're going to try to move through this as quick as possible because we need to get to the good stuff. My question is, when did, when did we move from Department of Defense to the Department of Interior? Okay. 
So that's a good question. We moved from the Department of Defense to the Department of Interior, because early on, back in the 1700s, there was only two Indian agents, what they called, one for the East and one for the West. Okay, And if you read Benjamin Franklin's earlier writings, he talks about the establishment of Indian affairs. Okay, And what did this mean? And the fact that the federal government based their constitution on the what they call the civilized tribes. This is where it came from, that foundation. But he also talks about how the US government made a mistake. Because if you look at how their system is set up with government, they're led by women. It's matriarchal. Whereas with the US system, it's set up to be patriarchal. Okay? And so with that being said, he talks about the formation of these Indian agents and what was their sole purpose. And so with that transition, as they recognize more and more of those treaties, those, those contracts, if you will, of how we are going to coexist together, okay? And once they discovered the resources, that's when the transition came in. So first we were under Indian Affairs, then we went to the War Department, then we went to back to Indian Affairs. And this all happened within the transition of from the 1700, 1778, moving on to 18, it was the early 1800s is when we moved back under the Indian Affairs. So I did a whole piece, actually I wrote a whole paper on this in this transitionary period because the impact that the Bureau of Indian Affairs has on our people today. When we talk about who is governing us, who makes the final decision, but we allowed that. So that's why this timeline is important. Okay? still under Department of War, or Department of Defense, not under the Bureau of Indian Affairs. It was only after we started to establish a governing body for our different reservations that we became under Department of Interior. So, with, but th there's, there was a lot of transition back and forth, and there was also confusion in regards to who was under the Department of War and who was under the Indian Affairs. So those treaty tribes were recognized under the Indian Affairs. Those tribes that did not have treaties stayed under the War Department. So you got to keep that in mind of what was happening politically in Congress. Okay? That's why this Marshall Trilogy is so important in regards to the foundation of Indian federal law. Okay. So moving on. Um, the expansion westward into our territories. And, and I'm focusing on us as the Ocheti Shakoi. And so in regards to that, we look at a lot of those tribes all of, in 1850s, this is where nearly all the eastern tribes were moved to the center of the country. And why? Because of the Ohio Valley. And why was the Ohio Valley so important to the immigrants of this country? And that was because of the resources, because of transportation, all of that had to do with that. Now, if you look at our treaties, we say in our territories, we didn't list the boundaries, the coordinates. We said from this mountaintop to this mountaintop. Now, why do you think our people did that? It's because they knew the whole ecological system from one mountain range to the other mountain range. And we knew what resources that benefited our people within those boundaries. So that's why it was important to recognize these tribes being moved eastward. So this goes back to the removal policy. So all of this is what was happening with Congress and how they were dealing with our people in relocating us. Several tribal nations lost their identity. They were forced, two opposing tribal nations were forced into one area and they had to coexist. They had to develop a government of how they were going to coexist. Which leads us to us as the Ocheti Shakoi. We look at the 1851 Fort Laramie Treaty 
And why is this treaty so important? Because this was the first time the federal government recognized our boundaries. And boundaries is so key. Recognizes the Sioux Nation boundaries for the first time. Okay? And this was the territory that they said we existed in as the Ocheti Shakoi. So in regards to that, this is what was set within that. It didn't give us any rights, but it defined our boundaries. So that's important to understand in regards to these treaties. Moving on, what happened? Short time later, the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty. And this led to establishing our rights, okay? But look at the loss of territory we took from 51 to 68, because now we wanted rights within our boundaries. And so we compromised. In regards to those boundaries, this then was defined as our boundaries, as the Ocheti Shakoi. Moving forward from 1876 to 1877, based upon that 68 treaty, they've discovered again what? Our resources and what was available in those areas and the land. And so with the Commerce Clause and these, the 68 Treaty was basically to make peace and give them right of passage. In that right of passage, this is when they discovered all of the resources available that was within our lands. So with that, government tried to force us into territories in which our people didn't understand because it was a violation of our 68 rights. 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty rights and not understanding why the US government was breaking their agreement with us. They fought, our people fought, which led to the Battle of Greasy Grass, the Battle of Little Bighorn, in which that at that time the US government seized the Black Hills and that was because of the gold and the expeditions that they were doing. And we had a lot of squatters going in at that time, but there we had no laws in place. We had rights, but no laws in place to protect our people, aside from our natural laws. And we have four sets of laws, but they didn't understand those four, four sets of laws. Why? Because it wasn't documented according to their history. So it moves us forward. What happened from 1871 to 1928? More lands were taken, and this was huge. This is when they were opening it up to the settlers. Federal law expanded into internal tribal affairs, so this was enforcing upon us. We can go back to Crow Dog ex parte and what happened with Crow Dog when he tried to settle it under our law, our custom law, in which they wanted retribution in regards to that. So that's why federal law expanded what we know as the Major Crimes Act for our people. Indian children were forced to attend government or church-run boarding schools, and corporal punishment was across the board for all of these school systems that were in place for our people. Reservation, uh, reserve tribal lands were allotted to Indian, individual Indian ownership. Okay, so this happened in 1887, what is known as the Dawes Act. And at that time, we were supposed to come U.S. citizens under this agreement. However, at that time, a majority of Congress were Protestants. And they composed, that's how, why we have the assignment of religions within our reservations, these boarding schools. So the religion that was assigned to our reservation was Episcopalian. Did you know that? 
then we had to get passes to leave our boundaries as a people because we weren't considered U.S. citizens, okay? So in regards to that, we look at this and we say, okay, now we're given land. And once we were given land, Congress said, okay, if, these are gonna, if they're going to own land, then they're going to pay taxes. And the only way they can pay taxes is if they're what? U.S. citizens under our law. So they tried to make us citizens. But Congress said, wait now, wait now. We're still considered uh, wards of the government. We're still considered not human, okay? Uh, we're also considered as heathens because not a lot of our people converted into Christianity. So moving on, it was voted down. We weren't considered U.S. citizens, therefore we did not have to pay those taxes. When our people fought in World War I, this is when Congress recognized and decided to make us citizens of the United States. So this is where it comes from in 1924. And as we move forward in 1889, when we look at those boundaries, what was up here from the 68 to 1877 and 1889, this is what we lost 21, and it was more than that, over 21 million acres in this process of allotment. And then we were divided up into these six smaller reservations. So when you talk about that one nation and being splintered as the Ocheti Shakoi, this began that process of dividing our people into these areas. Moving on from 1899, in, in 1880, the Supreme Court ruled the seizure of the Black Hills is one of the grave injustices in this country that happened to our people. But you have to understand what they were ruling on was not to give back the Black Hills. What they were ruling on was how much they gave us for the Black Hills. So people got to keep that in mind. What were those attorneys fighting for then? And early on, our leaders fought and they tried to form a coalition from the Ocheti Shakoin to get the Black Hills back. They approached the BIA to get attorneys, and the BIA shot them down several times. But there's an act that comes into place which allowed us in the 1980s to go after the federal government. And this is important. So we'll get into that. So this is where we are what is known as the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. And we're only a sub-band of the Tituan. And the Tituan is one of the nations within the Ocheti Shakoi. And the Tituan has seven bands. And the Oglala is one of the seven. So they ended an allotment to restore Indian lands. The U.S. government created programs, projects, health facilities, irrigation work, roads, homes, schools to help restore Indian economic and cultural life, is what it says. And that was to be reinforced by the 1934 Indian Reorganization Act. But prior to that, there was a study that was commissioned by the president. And this study pointed out to the government that what the Bureau of Indian Affairs was doing to our people. This study showed that the Bureau of Indian Affairs said that they were the experts in education, in Indian education. They were the experts when it came to our forestry and natural resources. They were the experts when it came to our roads, our judicial system. They were the experts in Indian affairs. 
But this study showed the same percentages we see today with Indian education, the same percentages with the social disparities, unemployment, So then government said, okay, we're gonna empower these native nations. And how are we gonna empower them? By giving them a government. Once they give us a government, then we'll be recognized. So this is where it all comes from, from the self-government of tribes. In this process, 100 tribes lost their identity in this process because they weren't included on that federal registry because it goes back to those treaties. And the BIAs, they started the relocation program, whereas 40% of our native people still reside in the cities. But we're starting to see them come home and they're retiring. So it's good because this is always going to be home for our native people. So the abuse of termination and relocation, we can go um, with that. These are the results that Congress passed from 1965 to present, and those are what we're seeing today. This is what we operate on. So look at the Pine Ridge Reservation today. And if you notice, you see a lot of checkerboard in there, don't you, in the sections? The checkerboard is going from allotted to trust land. And if you look in this area in Lake Creek, see how bad that erosion is? Now, currently we had the land buyback. What do you think that map's gonna look like now? And we've been asking for that map, so hopefully soon we'll get that map to be able to show to the people what that looks like today under the land buyback program. And so moving us on to the IRA. We didn't hear a lot of positive things about the IRA government. But this is what it did. Where did it put us? It put us above state government. But we do not exercise that authority as a tribal nation with our constitution. It puts us in line with the federal government. Okay, so this is what it did in regards to the IRA. It put in tribal governments, tribal laws, and then chartered tribal businesses, education, Indian preference is huge. Appeals, uh, repeals allotment system. They put money in true, new trust lands and then they um, allowed us to establish our tribal court system. So this is where it came from. The IRA government, what is known as the Howard Willard Act, has 17 articles. And in these 17 articles, how many of you knew that? That there were 17 articles under the IRA Act? How many of you know that the blood quantum of one-fourth for membership came from the IRA? didn't come from our treaties. Never did state anything about blood quantum in our treaties. But it came from the IRA to define our membership. That's where it stems from. So the purpose of, of this was to end the, uh, the Allotment Act and to preserve our boundaries. It was to... Um, basically allow us to develop our resources and our land, to allow us to form businesses, other organizations, allows us to establish our own credit system. It granted us certain rights of home rule. So when we talk about home rule is when we were doing Indian preference. Anywhere else, that would be considered discrimination provide it for vocational education. So this, this part, this vocational education has really transpired throughout the decades. 
So this is what it allowed it to do. These are the articles and the subheadings, but because of time, I'm gonna just um, breeze through this so we can move on to the second part of the presentation because you can you also have the we we have copies available if you need them of the Howard Willard Act to review that and investigate that but under the Howard Willard Act it allowed us to sue the federal government which was the first time which allowed us at that time to go ahead and go back and ask for the Black Hills so there's this big pot of money. Once that 1980 ruling happened, there's a big pot of money that sits in a BIA account. Do you guys remember the Enron scandal that happened back in the 90s? And it was on the news morning, noon, and night. Well, during the same time frame of the Enron scandal, guess what? Millions of dollars was missing out of this BIA account. And did you hear that on the news morning, noon, and night in regards to money missing? Was our people and our tribal government aware of this money missing? Was the treaty councils on top of this money missing? See, that's why it's so important to understand where this all stemmed from and how it impacted our people. And today, you know, speaking from tribal government's perspective, as a tribal member, and, and for myself, we're gonna fight to preserve our tribal lands and we wanna get back the Black Hills. We're not trying to give away the Black Hills to anybody. So, moving on to the Constitution, IRA. This is when it was implemented, 1936. It was enacted in 1934 but we adopted it in 1936 as a tribal nation, known as the Oglala Sioux Tribe. It was amended in 1969, again in 1985, 1997. So when we talk about Article 3, Article 6, and Article 10, when we look at boundaries, this is when it impacted those changes, was in 1997. So, we looked as a task force for the research. What was changed in 1996? Did it go back to the people? Did the people have input in regards to the revisions? What articles were revised? We couldn't find that information. We went to 1985 and we looked for those revisions. Did it go to the people? No. 1997, where's those revisions? Couldn't find them on file. 2008 is what we did find on file. So we'll talk a little bit about those revisions. So the last constitutional revision happened for our tribal nation was in 2008. And in 2008, they only revised eight of the 17 articles, right? It was eight. So in regards to that, did it go to the people? No? So this is the first time ever that this revision is coming from the people. These were the articles that were revised in 2008. And so <clears throat> if you look at Article 2, nothing was changed in the territory under Article 1 in those revisions, neither uh, in membership they added Section 2 under membership in 2008. Article 3, there was no changes in the governing body. That has 10 sections. Article 4, that was powers of the council. There's three sections in there. And in 2008, what they did is they revised Article 1, subsection 1S and 1I, one N, and they add it one W under that article. In Article 5, which is judicial powers, they revise that, and they add it sections 4 through 7 in that. So 
you can see here then in article article uh, what is that 11 12 12 is when they finally added the Bill of Rights that was finally added in the Constitution was our people's Bill of Rights in 2008 and that has 10 sections with that um, and that's why it got revised under it was uh, under membership that they were to develop the Bill of Rights so with that you see all the revisions that happened under those articles and we wanted you to be able to see that what got included and what got revised in those sections in 2008 so with that this is the fun part this is when you get your surveys out you get the constitutions out and we're going to talk about first instead of going into our article one let's look at that preamble because that was brought up earlier in the discussions about dislikes the preamble states we the Oglala Sioux tribe of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in order to establish a more, poor, more perfect organization, promote the general welfare, conserve and develop our lands and resources, secure to ourselves and our prosperity the power to exercise certain rights of home rule not inconsistent with federal law and our treaties and in recognition of God Almighty and his divine providence, do ordain and establish this constitution for the Oglala Sioux tribe. So what do we need to change within the preamble? In our previous discussions with other districts, this is some of the language that they added in our preamble as we documented it. And it's just to share with you as an example. We, the people of the Oglala Nation, in order to preserve our sovereignty, our sovereignty, enrich our culture, achieve and maintain a desirable measure of prosperity and the blessings of freedom acknowledge with humility and gratitude the goodness and the guidance of sovereign rule of the universe in permitting us to do so do ordain and establish the constitution for the government of the oglala sioux tribe that was just an example that came from one of our district meetings as to how we could change our preamble because they talked about sovereignty and it was important for them to mention sovereignty but also going back to our values so that's just an example so what are your thoughts what should we include in our preamble what should we take out from our preamble Yeah, we're at it, Article 1's up there, but I want to focus on our preamble because it was part of our discussion this morning. Anybody have any comments? Do we want to leave it as is, or do we want to add sovereignty? Do we want to add sovereignty. culture? Or I think um, also too on the survey if you don't want to speak up there's you can always write it in on your likes dislikes any changes that you would like to see and uh, the preamble is also on the survey Tina I, I believe that um, that um, description or example that you just gave was really good but uh, one thing that really helps people are most of our uh, tribal members are highly visual so in order to add to that that would have been nice if you had 
posted an example up there because that first part was, was really good. And then our cultural piece needed to be added into that. And then I think we would really have an awesome preamble. Okay. The, um, the part of the Ogallala Sioux Tribe, I'd, I'd like to see that change to Ogallala Lakota Tribe in um, the home rule not inconsistent with federal laws and our treaties and in recognition of the Ogallala Lakota tribe do ordain and establish this constitution. Take out God Almighty and his divine providence. Anybody else? I'd like to see the example that you had just read um, up there also so that, you know, because I'm a visual person, I like to see the results of things, but our, the pre con uh, current preamble as it is, um, is just not, uh, it, it's somebody's, but it's not ours, and it's not ours to our way of life. Um, I think that when they were talking about boundaries, you know, we put ourselves into the boundary of the reservation that we were uh, given to live within. And I think that even though uh, geographically this is where Pine Ridge Reservation is um, per se, I think we have to remember, you know, who we are as a people and that uh, no matter what the preamble says or the Constitution says or federal law, uh, they can't contain our spirits and we need to uh, somehow um, say that. In, in, if we have to have a Constitution, then the opening of that, the preamble, should define who we are as the people within our ourselves that we are free spirits and they cannot contain us you know and if we come from that frame of mind and pass that frame of mind on to our children and grandchildren and so forth you know maybe we won't be as oppressed as they say because we're not sitting here in this little spot that they gave us you know or marching along in a in a nice neat little line so i think that anything that talks about um, reference to a boundary you know should be uh, changed or, or taken out and uh, defining us as the people that we are. You know, and so uh, if we leave, you know, leave the, those, um, the wording of that, anything that relates to a geographical boundary. Thank you, um, everybody. Yeah, the great comments because um, this... Um, government, this change in the Constitution is coming from you now. This was handed to us and forced upon us, so we have to keep that in mind. It's our opportunity to make it ours. The first word we, the Oglala Sioux Tribe of, is talking about the Pine Ridge Reservation, but the definition, the Pine Ridge Reservation, is part of the Great Sioux Nation. The territory, uh, when the treaty was written, that map you had on the wall earlier, somehow identify that wording, Pine Ridge Reservation of the Great Sioux Nation, or that area. Because we're, we're part of something bigger in a treaty, we're not alone. You have all these other tribes as part of that treaty. So to recognize that in a preamble, that Pine Ridge, the Oglala Sioux tribe itself, is just one part of something bigger. So to write it, that first sentence, to recognize the treaty territory rather than just the Pine Ridge Reservation.
<laughs> since you're here now. Okay. You know, when, when we refer to uh, our lands and resources, I hate to, I hate to bring up the Bureau of Indian Affairs, but uh, there's a distinction between our lands and our resources. Because if it's on allotted land, it's governed by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. If it's on land that is referred to as tribal land or tribally controlled land, then the tribe has a say so on what can and can't happen on those pieces of property. But they can't go over there and say, on that piece of allotted land, you can or can't do that. It's the Bureau's responsibility to do that. So in somewhere in our preamble or somewhere in this thing, it should, when you say our lands and resources, it should include those allotted lands. Okay, in, in regards to culture and how um, our people govern, I don't know if any of you listened to the news, but when the, uh, over the weekend when they had this government shutdown, one of the um, Republican senators mentioned, we should use a talking stick. So that tells you something that people really respected the way that our tribal councils used to conduct business. So I really thought that um, that was unusual and I thought it was a kind of a backhanded compliment to our people. So therefore our preamble should also re specifically reflect our cultural practices. We go back again and your presentation was really, really well. I, I would like to have a printout of that if possible. Uh, different ones mention that. But one of the things is that you go back and what is foreign to our people is even the Oglala Sioux tribe. You know, we are not Sioux. We're Oglala Lakota nation. And I would like to see that change because I think it was officially changed at one time, but it's not in our constitution. And the rest, what you um, suggested or what you read, I think it's really good because it addresses that we are a sovereign nation. We have inherent rights and we need to exercise them. So I think that's really um, a start because it's really ironic how all these years we went by that name. So that's all I got. So at our lunch break, what I'm going to do is I'm going to include a slide for the preamble so you can see that. And then what we'll do is we'll um, get those printed out, the PowerPoint presentation for you guys, OK? The other thing is, is um, I just wanted to give you an example of, of what the thinking's out there with our people that are coming from the communities. And when they look at our preamble and how we defined it, and like you guys said, we need to frame it based upon our culture, our values, the way we govern ourselves, and, and that we come from a bigger group. We're, we're, we're only a sub-band of a larger group. So I think that's important to recognize that in, in our rights, our sovereign rights as a, as a nation. So those are all good suggestions. And Ms. Connie is documenting all of that up here. On, and we take your comments. And like I said, your comments is being recorded. But we also need you to put that down on your on your surveys so that we have documentation to say, yes, this is what the people told us. It's not coming from us, but it's coming from the people. Okay? So now we're going to go to Article 1. <laughs> okay. So with that, Article 1, and I'm going to have Jackie read Article 1 for me because I don't have my glasses. And I think I'm getting to the point in my life where I need bifocals. So I'm going to have Jackie read Article 1 for you. That's the same one up there, right? Yeah. The, ju the jurisdiction of the Ogala Sioux Tribe 
of Indians shall extend to the ter territory within the original confines of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation boundaries, as defined hereafter added thereto under any law of the U.S. except as may be otherwise provided by the law for unrestricted lands, to regulate the inherent inheritance of property, real and personal, other than allotted lands within the ter ter territory of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. All right, so again, some of the discussion around that um, article was it doesn't have any mention as to our treaties or to our relationship. And you made a good point. What is our relationship? In other constitutions, tribal, tribal nation constitutions, they included their relationship with the federal government. And so that's defined in there in regards to the relationship as a tribal government and how they work with the federal government, okay? The other thing is, is when they talk about territorial jurisdiction, this was, again, these are notes that were taken and, and I just put them together. Okay, the boundaries of the Oglala Lakota Nation territory shall be those described by the patents of the 1861-1868 Fort Laramie Treaty Diminished only by what treaty? What act? <laughs> nope. Right. The Dawes Act. That's when it diminished those. So th th that was some of the thoughts from, coming from our districts is that they wanted to include those to say these were our original territories and they were diminished by this act, but we as a tribal nation still recognize those traditional boundaries, which was stated in 1851. The Dawes Act only referred to land. We still have other rights within those territories, hunting, fishing, and gathering. Those are our resources that were guaranteed us under those treaties. and. If you remember, Russell Means went to the Black Hills and he was fishing. And they tried to make him get a license and he said, no, I have a right to fish in my territory. And uh, the state of South Dakota didn't want to push it because they're going to lose. So nobody knows this, but there's another case that happened in Wyoming in which the individual lost, I think it's called a two, bear, two bears case, where a guy was hunting an elk outside the, the federal boundaries, and he lost his case. So those are some of the things that, uh, and by the way, that guy was a Crow Indian, but he's also in the 1868 treaty. But we didn't lose all those other rights, just the land. That is our territory. Right, so, but we don't that. What do we list in our Constitution? This land. What I'm trying to point out is that these were ideas coming from people saying we don't include our treaties in our territory, our original treaty territory boundaries. That's not included in our current Constitution. What did we say? We really restricted ourselves, didn't we? Because we're saying Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. That's how we're defining our territory. We don't say anything about treaties in our territory, do we, in our Constitution? So I'm saying, should we include that in our territory under Article 1? But again, like I said, it needs to come from you as to what we need to include. How do we revise this? I believe that we should include our treaty territories to uh, cover everything that we may or may not do that would seem illegal to the federal government 
or the state government. I stepped out the door and missed the preamble discussion. Um, I'm a little ill today, so. Um, I think it's important. We have the inherent rights language, the inherent territories, uh, cultural significance language. It's important to have uh, a treaty territory language in there. I would wouldn't recommend that we put any language in there that that uh, restricts saying these now currently under Dawes Act, you know, restricted under. I don't, I don't think our children need to read that and think that they are restricted. Um, I do have concerns. Um, we tried in the past, to, in 2008, we wanted to regulate arts and crafts and there's some other language within treaty territories. And the solicitor kicked that back and said our people can't vote on that. So um, when we do changes, if we don't start with the understanding that of how are we going to do this, are we going to even ask and, and ask anyone else's opinion, are we going to ask just ourselves internally? on how we want to live. If we're going to ask the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Solicitor General, uh, all the way up the chain there, a lot of the talk is, is probably just for historical purposes then, because it's going to get kicked back. Um, there was, I thought there was like 28 articles we tried to change, or 28 changes, not articles. 28 changes to those articles and you mentioned se only several of them got voted on it. Um, that was the reason uh, for most of them. We couldn't even address it as a people because the solicitor said no. You can't even vote on that. A lot of people were upset about that. So uh, I think it's important that we establish are we going to ask permission or, or not when we're discussing this matter. So. R25 has been revised, okay? So under the CFR 25, there's been revisions where we as a tribal nation can take that out where we do not need to get permission. It's how we frame it and how we word it as a people. So if we want to list our territory, our treaty territories, we can. So with that being said, there's been a lot of revisions and it's good to just stay on top of those revisions because with that, we need to, you know, really push that authority that we have as tribal nations and, and we haven't exercised that. Now it's time. Territory of a treaty is the treaty itself is between nations of people. Constitutional territory is what this is all about. So Article 1 territory is the POW area, known as the Pine Ridge Reservation. But in here, inheritance, we did inherit an area called Hell's Canyon. So our Constitution and its laws and enforcement of laws govern that area of Hell's Canyon or any other area the state of South Dakota or the U.S. government gives back to Indian nations. Thank you for that information. So with that, that's good. That's good information that you shared with us and, and to keep that in mind. And the differentiation, what you said about the territory, and, and you know, we never gave up that. We never did. And so we got to remember that. And I think, you know, it's a part of our history for our children and the next generations coming forward in regards to those boundaries or territories. Okay. Any more discussion on Article 1? So Connie's got a couple of pages up there in regards to the revisions and additions to territory. You know, you, you brought up that map where it showed Bennett County in the, in the dotted area? Yeah. Well, 
Bennett County was incorporated as a county, state, county. Bennett County was incorporated as a state county and, and uh, the, the people there that live there, that own uh, deeded land there, they said they claimed that Bennett County was no longer part of the reservation. So in some of the maps it shows Bennett County is not in the reservation. But there was a court case in, again in the 80s which proved them wrong. They are still part of the reservation. They're, they can't take themselves out unless they have permission from the tribe. Major number of 
years. And the federal government, a lot of the tribes have concurrent jurisdiction. So I don't know who we were talking to, but as a chief of police, I had to know my territory. And I had to be very aware of what kind of jurisdiction I had. So, um, I'm not going to disagree with you. I'm just saying that we need to be more knowledgeable. And everybody needs to be knowledgeable. This is your reservation. What we do with the federal government um, has to be put out there so we don't get blinded by stuff like this. So, thank you. What are the unrestricted lands that reference in this article one where it says um, provided by law for unrestricted lands? What land is that? So the unrestricted lands, when it stopped the dog sack, which is the erosion of our land base, the unrestricted lands allows our tribal nation to go after lands outside of the reservation unrestricted lands. And so that, for example, we got lands, we went in with other tribes to get Peshla. That's unrestricted lands. Okay? So when we talk about federal lands, like what we thought was a federal land up there, when we talk about federal lands and unrestricted lands, where right? those are still our lands if we go back to those boundaries, those territories, those regional boundary lines. That's what we're talking about in regards to those unrestricted lands. The allotted lands is when they gave us land assignments for our ancestors when they were living on 160 acres. So would that include like the lands in Bennett County that are long mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that that's that's an argument we haven't even tested yet because we don't have anything in place to support it under this because we restricted ourselves to it. So when we talk about jurisdiction, that's another issue, you know. And we do have something in place. However, there's a lack of respect in regards to consulting with our tribal nation regarding our laws. Now the state is being made aware we have a lot of laws in place and they need to respect it by consulting with us. All right, that was a really good discussion. I have one question. Yes. Uh, can you round it up? Uh, I guess it's more of a comment than anything is that uh, maybe the language in as you're writing it or uh, re rewording it needs to be a little bit clearer, uh, you know, and if we're talking about uh, our original territorial boundaries as described in the treaty, maybe that needs to be stated that way rather than com confines of the primary Indian reservation boundaries. Then also such language as defined hereafter, added there to, you know, what does that mean? What is that specifically going to uh, mean to the common person, you know? And then also, I have a suggestion uh, as to recognizing or defining our Oklahoma people as Indians. Because we all know where that word came from. And so, I, you know, I would... Uh, recommend or suggest, you know, that, that the word Indian isn't uh, used anywhere within our, within our Constitution. And copies got those written down right now, so to remove those and then to create the language and language terms where it's simple, it's understandable for the people to define the information. Moving on, Article 2. So, with Article 2 is membership. And Jackie, do you want to read membership for us? Yeah, Section 1, membership of the Oahu Sioux Tribe shall be automatic when A, the person's name appears on the official roll of the Oahu Sioux Tribe of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation as of April 1st, 1935, or if the person 
person's name appears on any correction made within five years after the adoption constitution on January 1936. B, a child is born at any member of, to any member of the laws and tribe. Section 2, the tribal council should have the authority to adopt laws covering future membership. Any comments on that? On Article 2 membership, I was wanting to add this Section 3 to it. I would like to see that. The Tribal Council shall maintain an official winner of membership on and off reservation of laws and tribal territory maintain a true and accurate Living rule. Living rule may be defined as we have people that pass, pass on and we have people that are born to our tribe and they're, they are members of this tribe. A winner count has an official um, document that we could challenge the U.S. Census count. Every time it happens 10 years, that census count is always inaccurate. And we're funded by those inaccurate count. Um, as if we can have our own tribal census winner count. It, it would give us that ability to challenge the government that we have more people than you're funding us for and when we depend on those funds in our education, health care, and well-being, welfare of this tribe. You know, that's a, that's a very good comment. And for example, in some of our constitutions within the districts, they require a census, not an enrollment update, but a true census. Now, the federal government does a census every 10 years, and like you said, it's an accurate number. Why? Because our people do not trust the federal government. So we're not going to give them all of that information. We also have what they call a community survey. And what they do is they take a sampling. This is done every month. And did you know it's happening on our reservation every month? So they do a community survey is what they call it. And this is what HUD kind of operates on them, is a sampling from our population. And what they do is they go out and they sample certain households to get that percentage. And um, with that being said, they use that small percentage to say this is the whole population demographics. Okay? So with that, it's not a true census, but that's what they base their numbers on, for example, for how, when they use those numbers. The Ogala Sioux tribe, um, they get a proposal to do a census across the board. However, with that being said, there was already a project in place which is called One Nation, One Number, and that is a survey of the houses. So it goes back to what they're doing right now with that survey. Well, yeah, my question was, um, I talked to some treaty people and they, to their understanding, they were informing me like on that membership, the federal government was um, with the Republicans in control. They were trying to get us into it like a lineal descendant. So I need more uh, interpretation on that. All right, thank you. So right now, the Oglala Sioux Tribe has what they call a, um, a code, uh, a membership code. And they update that. It's it's governed by a committee, a representative from each district that goes and, and works on that enrollment code, okay? So the enrollment code was updated and they're basing it on lineage, what you're talking about, to, to go back to um, show that you have a family member um, that is an enrolled member. We never talk anything about being on the original census, going back to those roles, we don't look at that. 
and we don't look at it as a living role as well. So those are not defined in that, um, that enrollment code. So these are things that we could also include with the revisions within under membership. In other districts, there's a lot of discussion regarding membership. They felt that the only time tribal council should have a say in regards to the enrollment code is if somebody wants to remove themselves as a tribal member. So that was one of the suggestions to go up there and adding a three that tribal council will review those who want to remove themselves as tribal members. And we do get those requests um, a lot of times where people want to remove themselves from our enrollment and enroll in another tribal nation. I have a funny story on enrollment. This guy from Allen, he was bragging about no, no other uh, race of people in his family. And he was talking to this guy and his kid comes up, yeah, this little black kid comes up and says, Grandpa hits him on the leg. Says, I want some water. So without looking down, he gets the water and he turns around and gives it to him and he says, Who's your mom? <laughs> we just blew whatever he was saying out, you know, and that's, that's pretty much how we are today. And we sit there and we talk about not having any other race of people in our lineage. But then all of a sudden, there's a child that comes up and ruins everything. So, uh, in my opinion, that little blood degree thing that we have on our enrollment cards shouldn't even be on there. It should just say tribal member. And to this day, I don't know how they could determine if that's how much blood I have or not. And the reason I say that is because when I was born, my birth certificate doesn't have a father on there. My mother's name was Redshirt. And so that was my name. But when I went to school, they changed it to Mesteth. And there's no legal documentation saying that I'm a Mesteth. And as I was growing up, my father treated me like a stepchild. And I loved him dearly anyway. And uh, back a few years ago when we had to have a birth certificate to get our driver's license, I went to get mine. They didn't have no Gilbert Mastiff. So uh, I went to the hospital and they said, well, you're a red shirt. So when I went to, back to the thing to get your birth certificate, there it was. Gilbert William Richard. So then, all those years, maybe 50 years of uh, having legal things and everything under mass death, coming to find out I'm not even a mass death, I was thinking, well, maybe I should just leave all that. <laughs> if there's something bad I did, I'd just leave that back there. <laughs> but I didn't. I asked my brothers and sisters respectfully if I could change my name to theirs. And they said yes. So I changed my name to Mesteth, and then I went and got into my driver's license. So those things happen. Uh, my comments would be, um, <clears throat> I think uh, if you can prove that you are you know, from, from our, uh, our people, you know, verify and, and cross-reference and people agree, I don't think there should be a timeline on our See, there's a five years after the 1935 was put on there, um, child born to any member of the Oglasu tribe. You know, I think that was added in there. Um, then, and then the, the change in 08 was tribal council have the authority to adopt uh, laws covering future membership. I think B was added in 08 too. But one of the things that I have um, trouble uh, acknowledging is that we're just members of something. You know, maybe there's other words we could use, uh, Oglala Oyate or Odakue or something that defines us more than just members of a club, you know. Um, 
I don't know if citizenship, citizen is too broad, but I was thinking Oglala, Oyate, define it a, another way, some that kind of um, gives a sense of purpose rather than just member, or members of a lot of things, I guess. Um, and this is a, a um, heavy subject on how you define who, who is who. Mm -hmm. But um, I like to at least have the wording changed and then the headings. So. So those are really good comments and other tribal nations, what they did is they didn't look at blood quantum, they looked at lineage, if they can prove lineage and Cherokee Nation as well as the Navajo Nation have the highest enrollment numbers. So what is tied to enrollment numbers is going back to our treaties and those trust priority allocations, what we call TPA. Now they don't go to the individual, they go to what is called the 638 programs, okay? So there's a lot of confusion in regards to how we define our citizenship, our membership, if you will. So with that, just you know, keep that in mind is why are these tribal nations really looking at lineage to increase their numbers? is because of those TPA, the trust priority allocations. So there's discussion around that and, and a lot of the other tribal nations when they revised their constitution, they looked at citizenship because these are rights that they get as being a citizen of this tribal nation. Whether they reside within those boundaries or off those boundaries, they have that inherent right because of the treaties. So we gotta keep this, they all work together. And you have to understand that within our constitution, we've gotta write it to support our rights, which are these contracts called treaties, okay? So with that, I think we have a couple of questions. I think sometimes it's hard to uh, try to define our our, our laws, our constitution, and, you know, trying to keep in mind who we are as a people and, and why uh, we even need to have the written law to govern how we live. However, we also can't forget that uh, we are subject to existing laws that came way before us and something as important as the treaty. So, when we're defining membership, um, I feel that uh, if, a, if an individual can identify lineage uh, or, or even like where your uh, family came from, which things like that are more important and more relevant to uh, us as a people rather than uh, identifying what the blood quantum is. And that blood quantum came from that same um, act that you, that you mentioned earlier. And from that same act comes our prisoner of war numbers, which people call our tribal enrollment number. Um, and a lot of the subsequent laws come, uh, come from that where um, you're talking about you know getting 638 dollars and so forth that's based on blood quantum as well and based on our tri tribal enrollments you know so uh, I think that if we were allowed to change uh, redo the constitution when you're doing redoing the constitution uh, just throw out that blood quantum and, and go on lineage because um, that's what people identify. That's how our families identify. They identify with that rather than coming in and here, uh, this is my relative here who is uh, one eighth uh, Oglala. You know, we don't say that. This is my relative. That's how it goes. So maybe even if our constitution can say that, and then we wouldn't be limited to like say for the for the uh, program that I work for, higher education. It says right in there that an individual has to be one-fourth tribal member. 
before we can fund them. So uh, that's what that, uh, that loss, it, why they put that in place so that we could get dollars for it, you know. Yes, I agree with you, and, and that's why I pointed out the Howard Willard Act, and that's where that quantum came from, that blood quantum. We never defined that. That's where it was originated. And then we did accept it. It was part of it. So in those revisions, that when they did this in 2008, they focused on lineage, a child born. So if they can prove it, you know, when you go and enroll, you have to prove your family <coughs> lineage going back. But the other tribal nations, what they say is, Lineage are descent of the original roles. And so if you prove descent, I think that's what, what we need to kind of look at is how we put that language. Whereas some of our community uh, members feel that they stick in to wanting to keep the blood quantum. So there's a lot of discussions. There's another side of that that, that people strongly feel that we need to go back to blood quantum. So, we got a question over here. Our yeah, um, I got involved in tribal government back in the 70s, and back back then, uh, there's a lot of people that believe that to be a tribal member, you had to be a full blood. Okay, and I. Uh, uh, I understand there you know, why they think that way. And there's a lot of tribes that require that you have to be a quarter, or uh, there's uh, some that you have to be half, you know. And the, the, there's good reasons for that. And I think that a lot of times uh, we tend to see things that we only want to see, you know, and that maybe is popular or, you know, but what I uh, suggest, I guess, to, to everybody is to uh, take a look at the other tribes in the United States, not just the other tribes in the United States. Uh, there's indigenous people in Canada, as an example. I've looked at a lot of their uh, 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 documents that relate to the land, uh, and their people and we shouldn't just look at our own ordinance i mean our own ordinances our own constitution let's look at others because <clears throat> there's other tribes that have changed theirs over the years and they've had different lawyers and they deal with different people and, uh, so that's what i suggest is that to look at the constitution and bylaws of other tribes and uh, I, I, for one, uh, personally, I, you know, I'm not, I'm a third, <laughs> I guess I'm a 21, 30 second, uh, and approximately a third, and uh, I believe there needs to be a quantum, I really do, because what I see, I see a lot of people that are less than, probably less than a uh, eighth Indian that are marrying non-Indians. And then their kids are probably gonna marry non-Indians too. You know what I mean? And yet they're still, they don't really have much to do with the tribe. You know what I mean? Uh, they're, they're mainly getting their kids enrolled to get benefits of some sort on down the line. And I see that as a problem, I really do, because we have limited resources. And if, if, you, if you just continue to allow everybody to uh, become members even though they're uh, one one hundredth say one one hundredth because this is going to happen I mean seriously it's going to happen within the next uh, 50 years yeah and 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 so that's why I really believe there should be blood quantums myself a quarter or something like that or eighth or whatever you know whatever the people would decide and I, I think that you know in here it says a tribal council but it probably should be a referendum vote you know, when it comes to membership. And so those are some of the, some of my uh, thoughts, I guess, and suggestions.
I was on the tribal enrollment committee for almost 10 years. And during that time, there was a lot of concerns about membership, blood quantum, identity, where an ID was given to a person who's a member, and yet our own state and other areas, businesses, won't recognize it as an official ID. The government came up with a different way of recognizing membership, social security card. At the time of birth, there's an application given to the mother for that. And it was required, requested from us committee members to give them also an application for membership. But blood quantum goes back to the treaty. Recognizing half or more can receive services from your tribe. But some of the tribes looked at the blood quantum, especially in marriage, going down where people, um, some tribes adjusted that to one fourth or more you can receive services from your tribe due to you know, resources. Tribe can't afford everybody to help them. But I think as a tribe, um, as I stated that one 264th blood quantum is on IDs now. But the, there was an elder, Johnson Holy Rock. He said, you take a bottle of water representing four fourths full blood Indian and you continue to marry non-members, you would have to some people an empty bottle, but to science, they can still measure the amount of water in it. So it'd be up to the tribe itself to either cut membership off at a certain blood quantum or continue. But how small of a blood quantum do you want in your official census rules on membership? One of the things I, when you're talking about the blood quorum is that I had a niece and it had to be <clears throat> maybe 20 years ago that there was a red cloud Chanupa that had service during that time. So one of the descendants had to go in Humblecha for four days and four nights. When she completed that, they gathered at the Sacred Heart Church and they took her down there and they, that, that place was full of, say, 70, 80 elderly were there, plus some of our spiritual leaders. And they asked her to tell what they had shown her. And the reason that I'm telling it is because I was told to. If she couldn't tell it, then I was to tell it. And she's since deceased. One, one of the things was that they had taken her to, to an old house. It was one of these old igloo houses, the long ones. And in there, there was all these grandpa and grandmas sitting there. And she said they brought a girl in with blonde hair and blue eyes. And they had her sitting there. And they, she, they asked her to speak, so she got up. And she was fluent Lakota. And they said, remember, this grandpa stood up, remember, as long as there are a drop of blood, those are still your relatives. And that's the kind of frame of mind I think that we have to get back to because they're giving us a direction in which way to go. And so that's the only reason I'm telling this story. If I had a great grandson that was born with blonde hair and blue eyes and didn't fall under that quarter, am I, is our tribe going to disown him? Are his relatives going to disown him? I don't think so. So we got to remember that. Thank you.
I just want to interject real quick in regards to that. It, you know, there was other discussion, and they talked about, you know, in some of the constitutions within our districts, they talk about their membership in their community, and they say bona fide member. And so, what is the definition of bona fide member? Is that they're land owners, and that's how they qualify to be that community member. So that's just something to think about when we talk about membership as well. Um, with me, years ago, you know, I'm 21 30 seconds of Ogallala Sioux, and my mother is Si Chung Hu. Uh -huh. And now, who decides that I'm 21 30 seconds? Do they do an equation thing with like Rosebud Sioux Tribe and Ogallala Sioux Tribe? Uh -uh. You know, and then. Um, I contacted Rosebud one time and they told me if I disenroll from the Ogla Sioux tribe and enroll in the Rosebud Sioux tribe, I'll be 13 16 So I have a question there on how, who decides the blood quantum. And then on the membership part, who checks to make sure that they're putting the right lineage, lineage down? Because one time I was, I was in an enrollment office and I was comparing my enrollment numbers to my sibling and this woman walks up and she's four force. I mean, no offense to the blonde eyed, blue eyed thing, but she was blonde eyed and blue eyed, a blonde hair and blue eyed. And how could she be four force? And I'm only 21, 30 seconds. So I want to know if they check to make sure that lineage is right. You know, maybe, maybe mom's lying, maybe dad's lying. You know, that's a concern I have about the membership part. Okay. So. Um, I know we have another comment up here and then we'll move on, but just just also keep in mind, you know, these are conversations that have been had in the districts and the communities as well. And and we're getting your thoughts and, we, and that's what we're doing right now is just getting your thoughts. And in regards to that revision, it goes back to that enrollment code. So they have a committee who goes through and follows that lineage because on that application, when you do fill it out, you kind of fill out the blood quantum too. And they kind of see and they track that blood quantum. So based upon that lineage, that descent. And so with that, we do not include other tribal members as a part of that blood quantum. It doesn't state that in our code, nor does it state it in our, our articles under membership. So we don't consider if I, my mom's Sikanju and my, my dad's Oglala, it doesn't matter. They're going to focus on the Oglala lineage. Okay? So that's a part of the enrollment code that they were discussing as well because they're not including other tribal nations as a part of that blood quantum. I have a comment. Okay. My grandpa and my dad were talking one time. They're, they're both about the same age. My dad was born in 1909. But this was back in the early 70s when Johnson O'Malley required a quarter, quarter blood to get money for your kids. Well, that was an issue back then. What do you call an Indian, you know? My grandpa said at that time that we shouldn't do that because we as full bloods, we, if we were to only be the ones who are tribal members, then we would end up marrying our cousin at some point, because that's all will be left. So relatives will be marrying relatives. And if you know the Lakota culture, that's taboo. And uh, you could marry somebody from another tribe or from another Lakota or Dakota tribe or from another Teoshpai that you have no relatives in but you couldn't marry anybody in your own Teoshpai because you're all re related and they, they made sure that instilled that in our minds so I know in my mind and I'm 63 almost all the names of all the people that I'm related to the surnames and all their descendants, whoever they are, I'm related to them. So I can't go and have a relationship with them other than just being a relative. 
And so that was a dilemma back in the early 70s of how, how we're going to be, you know. And my grandpa said, that's the Washichu way of getting rid of us. He's putting that good blood quantum on us. Because eventually, like we're seeing today, there are some people who are less than a quarter are still on our rolls. And if we were to go by that, there's a, be a huge number of children that's not on our, not, that can't be members of our tribe. And as we die out, there's not going to be any, any more. So he said, back, in, back then, you have unlakota plo, chua, hechun se unkum washte. That was my comment. Okay, there's a lot of good discussion. And I wanted to just add, kind of like a, maybe a suggestion that using the lineage and the descendants or descent, as well as if blood quantum is so desired, you know, using all three. But I really, I'm in support of the lineage and the descent, you know, because it is, it's true. Somebody mentioned that your tribal ID, it even shows your blood quantum. And I really, I kind of take offense to that because we're kind of uh, late, graded or something. So I wouldn't, that's just my suggestion. Thank you. Well, those are all really good comments and suggestions and Connie's got all of that written down and, and make sure you put these thoughts on paper as well on your survey. Okay, so article three. How many of us are ready for a quick break? Or do you wanna go into article three? Okay. We are doing this as, as, as a true way of consensus, because that's how we used to govern ourselves, is by consensus, not majority rule. And so I see a, a lot of hands up, and uh, I think we do need a quick five minute break, and then we'll come back, get some coffee, there's rolls, and then we're gonna come back and we're gonna work on governing body, which is article three, this is where it also lists out the district boundaries. So you can see that in Article 3. And so, as well as the, you're, you, in those sections, you're going to see those 1 through 10. And what does that constitute? So we'll work on that when we come back. So quick five-minute break. Okay, if we can get started, and we'll cover Article 3. And then after Article 3, we'll break for lunch. And then we'll come back and, and um, because I believe we have until three. So believe me, as we get moving, remember we have 17 articles within our constitution and we're just now on article three. So with that, <clears throat> article three is the governing body. And within it, it has one section with 10 subsections. So, with that, Jackie, do you want to read section one? The governing body of the tribe under this constitu constitution shall be a council which shall be composed of councilmen chosen by secret ballot by qualified voters of the tribe, which council shall th hereafter be known as the Ogallala Sioux Tribe Council. So what would we revise in section one? It says councilmen. Okay, so add council representatives. Okay. So to update the language, what else? <laughs> okay, they should be chosen by secret ballot, by qualified voters of the tribe, which the council shall hereafter be known as the Oglala Sioux Tribal Tribe Council. Not tribal, Oglala Sioux Tribe Council. Yes, but we're gonna change that language, Oglala Sioux Tribe, right? Oglala Sioux Tribe. 
Oglala Nation was the other recommendation. Okay. Okay. So add Oglala Lakota Nation. In the past, Oglala Sioux tribe was challenged to be changed to Oglala Lakota Nation. In the funding departments of this country, they didn't recognize Oglala Lakota Nation at all. So the struggle was to leave it Oglala Sioux Tribe. But in the past also, um, Treaty Council, the revision of the Constitution was to look at, not by secret ballot, by majority vote, the leadership representing their district shall be nominated by the people of that district. But I don't know if that was acceptable. It never took place. So if you have a leader who represents the people as a person, not, a, not anything else, a, a, they called it a people's people, then each district was to change their constitution to allow that to happen instead of by ballot vote. So whether or not the tribe would do that is up to this revision, I guess. So. Okay. Okay. So <clears throat> that's what was, I guess, agreed upon in the past. But I think there was discussion of, um, yes, that did pass the name change. It did go to referendum. It did pass to change it to Oglala Lakota Nation. I think the, the discussion was, is, like you said, it, it, it was also worrying about funding and so forth. And what we have to do is apply to change our name on the federal registry. That's all we have to do to make that name change. But the person, nobody was assigned to follow up in that process to make the name change on the federal registry. So we could still do it because it already passed by the people. So that's something that, you know, we need to be, you know, when we make these changes, we need to create the processes in which we follow through with all of the, the changes. Did we already change that through yeah. a referendum vote? That's what I'm saying, but or it was no. never changed on the federal registry. Is, yeah. that, is the, districts, the districts even uh, legal because there has not really been any boundaries defined, is what it says in the Constitution? One of the things that I'm hearing from different uh, people that are discussing this is that your election should never be by a uh, population. It should be about leadership, and it should be up to the people to define that. So one of the things is that uh, they talked about election at, at large, that be nine representatives to represent all the people, not just their district. Um, another thing was our membership that live off the reservation, that they're kind of disherited and not allowed the same privileges because they had to leave for economic reasons or whatever, that they should still have a voice in this, so, and then the need for an executive board. What is that need when they, own, they have limited powers too? And looking at it as, you know, a lot of money comes through our tribe and looking at a business console, and I've heard this since she, I was a young girl, uh, people talking about this is that uh, we really need a business console, we don't need an executive board. So, with qualifications, so I wanted to put that as a part of it, but it's just hearing from other people that I've discussed things with or listened to, you know, so that's all I got. Thank you. Okay. So, <clears throat> the suggestions is that we update the language in section one 
and then to uh, also the name change. So moving on to section two, it says that each district of the reservation as follows shall be entitled to representation on the tribal council according to population as herein, herein after provided. And in 97, we just had this discussion, this is where these changes came about, and it was defined. Apparently it was, and it was voted on, and it did pass, however, it was never implemented. So today, in regards to the revisions that happened in 2008, what is there is that, for example, Oglala District, the Tribal Council shall describe boundaries by ordinance with local participation through district hearings. That was the process defined in which boundaries were to be determined by council, not the district. So, has this happened? No. The district boundaries was done in the 80s by the BIA requested by tribal council. It's 8368 or 6883, can't remember which one it was. The document taken back to council to vote on. These are your boundaries according to the current constitutional map of the tribe. But then Pine Ridge wasn't a district when that was done. So they questioned Pine Ridge territory. But the document still existed. No one voted on it, they didn't rescind it, it's still there. So the territory of each district wasn't done the way the map showed. Some of the district boundaries were a creek. So they couldn't measure a creek. They had to use longitude, latitude. So it was a little zigzag. Uh, the person who worked for the borough was La Pointe, last name. He was threatened, shot at, ridiculed. <laughs> when he was doing that survey, according to that map, he was given to follow between the districts. So it could be brought up again. I have a copy of it, and I was asked repeatedly, find it, bring it. But to enforce that, you know, it was done. All right. Uh, the issue of the boundaries was also done in 97 amendments. And I was just uh, visiting with um, Tina. Tina. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just <laughs> uh, being an elder. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so. And the reason I know about that firsthand is because I worked for the Bureau of Indian Affairs at that time and was in charge of um, doing the um, paperwork and procedures and things like that for that for the um, revisions. So the boundaries were done at that time as well, and they were uh, voted on. Uh, through the, for, by the people, and that was also signed off on by uh, Cora Jones, who was the regional director at the time. So where it stopped, though, was when it was given back to the tribe, tribal council, to implement the changes, that, did, that part there didn't occur. So I uh, told Tina that somewhere in my uh, paperwork that I have, uh, I do have a copy of that. And that co those copies at the time when, um, when it came back to us, signed off on, then we made copies upon copies to be given to district people, uh, to council, to, to who, whoever wanted that because that was a public document that could be given. So, and, and that's how I have a copy of it as well. So I'm gonna search through my stuff and get that to you. That would be great. So we can finally address this because right now the way it's written and because there's no documentation in place, 
to substantiate, you know, what everybody's saying, we have to take it as hearsay until we have the documentation um, to prove. So with that being said, at this point, you know, when we say at large, well, we have every right. That's why the election should have been held at large because the way it's currently stated within our Constitution. So anybody can legally challenge the the whole last ad, this this administration in regards to the way it's written as well as past administrations and i can go vote in whatever district because there's no boundaries defined according to this constitution so and and nobody can stop me from doing that so with that being said the way it's written that is what's creating it now so how do you determine how do you determine having representatives three representatives in your district when you don't even have boundaries to determine what is your population within those boundaries. So these, these are all leading back to, like I said, it goes to Article 3, Article 6, and Article 10. So they, this is a, a huge discussion that we really need to think about as a people because what we're doing is really limiting ourselves and hurting ourselves in regards to that. Because like you said, we want to get back to that thought of one mind, one nation, you know? So with that, the way it's written, we'll continue to segment and fight over boundaries because that's what happens every administration when we talk about boundaries. So we could just say, do away with that, have nine representatives, for across the reservation. That can be a solution. As an example, is what some of the people talked about. There's two back there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, those are my, some of my thoughts exactly. We are. Uh, changes in 97 and never prescribed by ordinance where these boundaries are, but we, we function historically, uh, you know, historical memory and, um, but clearly there, there needs to be some issues addressed here. We, we can't count, we can't decide who's our representatives. Um, uh, it's not a very good way to run, run uh, government by the people. You don't even know who the people are in your district. Um, one of the ideas that tossed around is general council. Some tribes use it where um, heads of family or the council um, or um, the, a certain threshold met, uh, announced the meeting quarterly or monthly and uh, you sign in, you verify that they're, they're tribal, they're, tri they're from the tribe and, and they have a voice there, they're of age 18 and over or whatever we deem an adult and a set of laws to be voted on are, are prepared by a, an internal body, internal body set to work year round, um, as opposed to doing no boundaries and nine representatives. I was thinking, why nine? Is it because there's nine districts? I thought we was going no boundaries, you know. But um, having a general council come in, and I think it might be cumbersome at times, but at the same time, we have buy-in. We have a lot of people uh, with the feeling and understanding that they have actually have a say in those laws. They would think it's just these uh, nine members that are all powerful directing their lives. Um, we have that general council or, or the heads of family show up. They'll be able to express on behalf of their family, and this might... Uh, uh, get people to commit more to the we the people understanding of the um, Constitution in the process Thank you Um On the district side, at Wundany District, we've been having problems with Wundany community, and I've been in uh, district politics for over 30 years since I started from day one. 
Wundani has always wanted their own government, Wundani community. But they're 300 people short. I was wondering if they want their own district. And they do uh, their land base when we had our boundaries is almost half of Wundani district. It goes clear up to, uh, well, you guys don't know our district, but it's pretty big, their, their district. And it used to reach all the way to Nebraska. And their population is bigger than uh, number nine communities, Manderson. They, they got about 15 more people, according to our census, than we do. Um, so, I was wondering if there was a way we could instill uh, putting them in as a district, having their own, because it's, as you know, our district fights with, and it's just them. They want their own government, and that's what they've been asking for for 30 years. Let, let us do our own thing. You guys do yours. Um, it's what they've been asking, so I was wondering if there's any way we could put a district in here and let the people vote to see if we can have another district. Just like Pine Ridge did in 97. Um, they have everything already in place for a district. They got the people, they got the government, they got everything set up, but they just don't have no, their own government. So I was wondering if, that would, if we could possibly put them in as a district and let the people vote to see if they can have their own district. So there's conversations about doing away with the district's representation, and then there's talks about having a general council. Um, there's talks about adding a district. You know, for example, in my our district, Steph and I, we have Retro Table and Oglala Jr., and their constitutions were approved by Congress. Therefore, the tribe cannot make revisions to those boundaries. The tribe constitution doesn't impact it unless it gets approved through Congress okay therefore these two communities that that's how they're viewed as communities should be viewed as a district because they were passed by Congress okay therefore they should have representation and they did in the past they had a representative from Richard and a representative from Oglala Jr. however Somewhere in all of these revisions, that got lost because Article 6 got changed, which is districts, right? They took a lot of authority away when they revised Article 6. So now the districts are at the mercy of what Tribal Council determines here. That's why it's important we define that in this Article 3, the governing body. So. Go ahead. In relation to people wanting things, uh, it came down to a service. There's an area of Wakbamni District was historically in a farm, farming community map of the tribe. Mm -hmm. Pass Creek, Medicine and Root, and Porcupine was affected, as well as Wounded Knee districts. Pass Creek, the Red Rock Housing of Batesland, Medicine Root, the Wakbamni Lake community, Porcupine Crossroads by the Gordon Junction area. The people living there, the Indian people living there wasn't receiving services from those three districts. They organized themselves as a community wanting to be Become part of Wakbamni District. The way it was written then, Wakbamni District accepted that. And all lands in between, which took out part of Wounded Knee District because of people on the border of Nebraska 
at the junction area and Denby wasn't being met by a wounded knee district. So Wakbamni adopted that area as part of the Wakbamni district. So that's where the current constitutional map shows that area, Wakbamni, the southern um, part of Shannon County. Where it has um, the district boundaries should be set up by the participation of the membership of that district. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. And I should, and it shouldn't be the council who decides where those boundaries are, but the chairman from those districts, they should get together and, and uh, agree where the boundaries are from just based on the the membership from their from their area or district, they should say, "Yeah, well, let's sit down." And I think that group is called the Crazy Horse Commission, made up of chairmen from each district. I think they're the ones who should sit down and say, "This is where we want our boundaries," and then take it to council and say, "That's what we want." And uh, it it would be a request from the people of the tribe and not made up from the council. So we had some good suggestions. Moving on to section three. <clears throat> Tribal councils shall have the authority to make changes in the foregoing list according to the future community needs subject to the approval of the Secretary of Interior. Now, why does council need to make changes and get approval from the Secretary of Interior? <laughs> I thought all those approvals were supposed to be taken out of our Constitution because we had a referendum vote that said to take those out and the BIA accepted that. So this is why it's important that we revise our constitution to remove that based upon the history. Again, it goes back to archiving and documentation. So we, we can make all, like for example on council, we can sit there and vote yes and no all day long, vote no, but that doesn't matter unless there's something that follows through in that action. And right now we don't have those in place. Okay, so those were to strike that, the suggestion is to remove it, and then also to look for supporting documentation that it went on to referendum vote for that to be removed from the Constitution. Section four. Here, you read it. <laughs> Section four, each recognized district shall elect representatives to the Tribal Council in the proportion of one representative for each 1,000 members are a remainder of more than, five, more than 500. Recognized communities with less than 500 members shall be consolidated by the Tribal Council with an adjacent recognized community. So Garfield, when you asked the question, why couldn't Wounded Knee, and you said they didn't have the population base to have you know, their own government or representation, is that if they have less than that threshold, then they get absorbed by that community. So we have communities that have less population, but how do we prove that? All we have is an enrollment update, correct? That we do in our districts is the enrollment update. We don't have a true census. So then again, how do we justify that when there's no true census? The tribe itself has, I believe, 52 communities. One of our communities wanted to do the same thing when they needed. They want representation, Slim Buttes. But again, population um, restricted that from happening. So if we continue to allow communities to have representation on tribal council, we have 52 members. 
of tribal council, but um, the tribe itself should be restricted to representation only for each district. That's what I would like to see Section 4 say, restricted to two representation, representatives each district. I know you've already spoken about this, but um, I think the voting should be at large because the representatives are there for the whole tribe, not just the district. And a lot of times it just comes down to a popularity contest. So. I guess I was fortunate back in the 70s to uh, see a couple tribal councilmen um, that were elected from Lake Creek District, um, I guess, uh, do a really good job of representing the people. And they did it by uh, working out of the district service center. And they were there almost every day, one of them, if not both. And they would show up at 8 o'clock. And if they had a council meeting at 10, a lot, most of the time they rode together to the meeting. And they were there at eight to nine, whatever, to help people. And they did this for many, many years. And this was Newton Cummings and Charles Badlin. And my concern is that if you go with a, this at-large at thing, and if they're not from that district, how are those people going to get assistance, you know? Because um, they have a wide range of assistance. Now, they do get assistance from the employees that work there, as well as their, the executive board, but sometimes they need assistance from the elected officials. And so, I, I for one, I'm an advocate for, for uh, keeping the districts as is. And uh, I guess there was one suggestion to reduce the uh, number from uh, to one per district. But anyway, I, I guess I I still believe in uh, having uh, instead of at large. I think it should be uh, at the local level to keep people that that live there uh, in those areas uh, have them there to you know help the people that live there. You know. Because you might end up with somebody that gets elected that lives, you know, 70 miles away, you know. And I don't think that's realistic. Thank you. I think right now we're going to go ahead and um, have a meal. And also maybe we can work through as a working session so we can continue on. Uh, we got up to 17 articles and we're just now on article three so <laughs> we kind of have to uh, move a little and then we have to be out of here by three yeah and pete can you give us a meal prayer please oh. We're all working together and um, we're getting things done for our future. Thank you.